So I guess at this point, let me turn it over to Steve. Well, I want to thank everyone for thank uh, Frank and Dave for uh, having me here. Um, I normally don't like staying behind podiums because that's where my computer is. I'll kind of stay to the side a little bit. But uh, uh, I guess they contacted me um, probably um, last week and said, "Hey, we got a, a possible opening, and do you have something you'd want to present?" And I said, "Sure. How about this? Uh, semantic Web for Java developers, because I'm a Semantic Web evangelist and have been for the last uh, I don't know six, seven years, something in that range." And um, and he said, hey, that sounds good. So I quickly put together some slides for you. And um, I've actually got some uh, big code examples uh, that I'll, uh, uh, they've been emailed to Dave already, but I'll email them to after this and he can distribute them to whoever wants them so that you have some working code to, you know, play with some examples, uh, some actual Java um, uh, uh, example applications. One does pizza uh, searches and another one does, um, um, you give it a textual document and it uh, extracts out all the pertinent facts and everything for you and drops it into an RDF store so you can search and some things like that. So, there's a, it's, you know, some things are practical and some things are just there for you to look at for code. Um, so, what I'm going to cover is um, what is the semantic web, some of the things going on in the web community, the evolution from being more of a uh, document and human looking at a document and following links to it to being something more of a uh, applications accessing um, content and being able to um, repurpose it and, and, and using it a lot better from an application perspective. And that's kind of one of the evolutions of the semantic web. It's what provides, uh, or one of the things that provides the markup, um, the modeling, if you want to call it, to uh, make applications be able to access data. So we'll talk about uh, what it is and uh, talk about the fact that it's really nothing more than just a part of an IT evolution that's been going on for uh, probably since the early 70s. And, We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, I uh, don't like to oversell anything, so uh, I always talk about the issues and concerns, things that are going on in the, in the uh, market segment that are problems, some future perspective. And that's probably all about maybe 15, 20 minutes worth of uh, talking. And then I'll cover um, some similarities between Java and Semantic Web. And then we'll go through some actual APIs and let you see some of the code. Uh, we'll talk about how they actually work. So. Um, Tim Berners-Lee was uh, the guy who invented, uh, or I won't say invented, but you know, first demonstrated HTML over the internet. Um, also, the director of W3C. He uh, is credited with the vision. And I'm going to go ahead and read it. I know everyone can read, but go the web was interaction between person and hypertext, uh, so intuitive that machine-readable information could actually uh, represent people's thoughts and uh, provide machine analysis would become a reality and be able to um, um, automate some of the human thought. So we're kind of summarizing and reading at the same time, uh, HTML crediting that uh, particular vision of his. But again, you notice that the areas that I bolded were machine readable and machine analysis. That's really what this semantic web concept is about. Semantic web is also a set of standards uh, that the W3C uh, maintains uh, to bring about this. And um, what you find is that the semantic web as a whole on the web is really not taken off. Uh, there's little bits of it. There's link open data type things. There's some other stuff out there. But what has happened over the last, since around 2004 time frame, maybe a little bit earlier for some industries, is that people grabbed these standards and said, hey, I can use these standards to do things like enterprise integration, to do um, uh, registries for my SOA, uh, to do um, a handful of different things. Some folks are using it in content management, uh, using it for um, search. That's a huge uh, uh, place of if you've got a, a model that uh, end users know, you can represent that in um, uh, using these standards and then uh, be able to uh, put your search services where they use that particular model. So these are some of the things. So you don't really see the semantic web as being the web is already migrated there, except for certain little pockets. But you do see this used in enterprises a lot. Um, Use this chart. There's a fellow named Mike DeCona that um, actually created this chart. So I've printed it in here. The, product, the book is called uh, Information as a Product. And basically what he talks about, he goes all the way back to 1945 in the days of Dr. Vandiver Bush uh, talking about uh, information overload. Many of you may have read this. And actually that's an interesting article because he talks a lot of stuff about um, mesh of uh, data, some things of this nature that actually are kind of some of the forethought that went into what the vision of the semantic web would be. But that whole area from the 45s to the 70s were a lot of uh, procedural programming, um, uh, 
you know, I worked in some of these environments uh, myself, well, not in the 70s, but some of the legacy environment that was left over from that when I got in, and um, had large edit programs, sometimes in COBOL, sometimes in other things. Your data was not marked up, it was just a blob of data. Um, it could have just as well been, you know, one thing as, as opposed to another. And, um, you know, the, the, the program was king, uh, I guess, in, the, in those worlds, in, in that world. Uh, around the 70s, early 70s time frame, uh, folks like Dr. E.F. Codd, other folks, came up with uh, relational databases, which actually put some thought behind the uh, marking up the data. So you're, you kind of see some movement toward, even though it's a proprietary schema, it's still some thoughts behind the data and, and representing the relationships. And there were reasons why that was done. And then in 1994, uh, you get HTML, um, in that time frame, I should say. HTML, you're able to uh, 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 have a, a common markup language that a certain browser can use to pass data across or represent data and pass it to users uh, on this internet. Uh, around 98 time frame, you get XML coming in um, that uh, you know, provides an open schema again for uh, exchanging data for machine readable. Um, anyway, so you can see the progression kind of what you, what you find is when you look through this IT evolution, it's all about going from something where data was not important at all to something where data is very important. And you just see this enrichment of data being important to the point where you get to ontologies. And um, ontologies are We'll kind of go through them a little bit more, but basically the idea here is that data becomes more important than the code. You um, you enrich the data in such a way that uh, less um, uh, less intensive applications, we'll call them, can actually access it. Things that are n not written for a particular domain can actually operate off that data and perform functions because the domain is modeled in the data as opposed to being in the application. And so that's what you've seen a, a movement to here. And so I'll say that this is an IT evolution that's been ongoing for 30 years. Um, almost 40 years. Well, yeah, 40 years, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, 40 years. I forget what year it is. Uh, 40 years, and um, so that's uh, kind of the idea here. Um, here are some of the ways that uh, semantic technologies are being used. I mentioned the top one there. I kind of rank these the way that I see them from customer base that I work with. Uh, I'll give you a little background. I do most of my work in the federal government community, primarily the intelligence agencies and the DOD. I also do a lot of work only for uh, commercial clients that are Fortune 50 or above. I don't really do a lot of work on um, you know mid middle tier companies and that kind of stuff. Uh, just the elite ones and um, and then the DoD and Intel community. But in, in the work that I've been doing and I've been doing this uh, since my first app was in uh, Semantic Web app was in 2002. It was uh, directly stemmed off of the attacks of 9/11. Uh, the, the program that I was involved in ended up creating the reports that were eventually used in the 9-11 Commission report and uh, talk about all the things that we could have done had we had technologies like the semantic web technologies. Um, and I'll leave it at that. But uh, So a couple of the areas are advanced search. The idea here is um, search enhancement and query replacement. Well, you know, can the semantic web do anything that you can't already do? No. You, as I said, the idea here is that you're trying to evolve to something that's data-centric versus code-centric. So it's not like you're going to do something that you've never been able to do, but this gives you ways of doing it in a more extensible and agile method. So search enhancement, query replacement. The idea here is that you build your models out and you have certain classes. Uh, I'll give an example. If I ask for, I'm looking for all the medical facilities um, or emergency medical facilities in an area, I could have a model behind that that said emergency medical facilities consist of hospitals with an emergency room and at least 100 beds. It consists of um, um, high priority facilities that actually have uh, emergency equipment. And so you can name a bunch of things that it consists of and put that into a model. You wouldn't have to build that into the application. And then you could have a simple reasoning application that's just a piece of generic code, uh, perform queries over it, and get back uh, additional things that you would search your databases for. That's the idea behind search uh, enhancement and query replacement. Passive navigation, um, how I use that often is if you have essential elements of information, I'll call them, that's a uh, United States Air Force term, but I'm sure it's um, use, useful everywhere else. But the idea is these are um, common terms that folks, um, end users know really well. Subject matter experts have you know, uh, said, hey, if you refer to a um, piece of carpet, it means this. You can't call the tile on the roof carpet. Um, if you've got those type of you know, pieces of information, it doesn't have to be 14, it could be 50, or some folks use 5, depends on what you, know, what you like to work with. The idea is that you can sort your data quite easily with this. Well, there are applications that have done this before. It's, again, nothing new. You see um, 
uh, different uh, search tools on the internet that sort things by time and, and things like this. But the idea behind it, using the semantic technologies, is that uh, you uh, build all this into your ontology, and then you just simply ask a question from a class, and you automatically have the properties that are, that are affiliated with that class, and that's what your facet navigation items become. So it just it's again, a little bit cleaner and easier to work with. That's the idea behind it. Um, another thing is process service product optimization. I just left uh, um, uh, Florida where I was working for a, uh, a company I'm not allowed to name, but I can say, they said I could say that they're the, uh, a Fortune 29 company. Um, <laughs> so you, look, you can look up Fortune 50s and you'll figure out who I'm talking about. But anyway, I'm not allowed to name their name though. So, um, but anyway, so what I'm use, doing there is that uh, you get a bunch of data, and, and again, this is something you can do with code, but you get a bunch of data from a bunch of different processing uh, systems. And what we do is we find the relationships between, there's like 180 paths that this particular uh, product can, that I was working on uh, could take. And the idea is that uh, there's all types of um, uh, uh, tools out there that will look and do correlation and that kind of stuff for you. But we did it with this uh, model, and we just said, hey, there's a uh, built-in ontology that said these are the possible paths that one could take. And we just find the relationships of ones that, that uh, where, where like a party goes through it, it ends up with a defect, what pass did it take, and we just look for some correlations. So, um, and then there's actually some process modeling uh, it, um, uh, standards out there, BPMO, uh, Business Process Modeling of Ontology, uh, that actually help you with the re-engineering aspect of, hey, how do we actually fix some of these defects? So these are just two uh, areas in that, um, that area. It doesn't have to be product, it could be any type of um, service or process or whatever. And actually, I don't know if uh, number two or number three is probably more prevalent, but semantic integration, um, I worked for a company in 2004, and we kind of uh, were the first ones to ever introduce a semantic integration product uh, based on a, you know, an ontology model, I'll call it a, basically a, a standards-based model. And the idea behind this is that um, you, there's all different types of tools out there, again, that could do it from an uh, ETL perspective, drop it into a data store, or, uh, there's tools out there that did it with XML. There's a whole EII uh, space, inter enterprise information integration space, uh, that uh, that existed. Uh, that were doing it in different ways. The difference is is that um, the the models that you develop in 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 ontology or in semantic web standards, uh, the relationships are very explicitly defined, as opposed to like a hierarchical in, in, uh, implicit uh, definition or something like that with XML. So. So this, you build a semantic model, you map it down to your various data sources uh, by ingesting in the DDL if it's a relational database or uh, web services, uh, bringing in the, the schema for the document that, that you're using as the payload or, or um, uh, if you're doing RPC, you know, bringing in just whatever the variables are. Anyway, so you integrate in your various data sources, you stick them to an ontology model, and then you do your queries into the ontology model, and you basically have some uh, agents that then fire off and pull that data back in. Uh, in terms of the model, and that's what's presented back to the end user. So that's, that's a huge area in the in the market space. Uh, one of the things that the semantic world has done a good job of is incorporating the structured text, because that's uh, kind of where the term semantics came from, is the textual world. Um, and what you find is that uh, there are a lot of, or not a lot, there's a couple of companies out there that will uh, look over a corpus of unstructured text and generate your ontology models for you based off of that uh, text. And, it's the old, you know, 80-20, which, which in reality is more like 60-40 here. They get about 60% of the way, and the last 40 is, you know, for you to figure out. And so that's uh, one of the areas there of how unstructured text is being incorporated into this uh, semantic integration world, which was kind of a little bit different than some of the past um, uh, methods. There, was, there were ways to do it. I'm, I'm not saying that. This one just took it into um, account um, up front. And then the last thing is uh, semantic fusion models. So fusion is a kind of a government term, but the idea here is you've got a lot of analytics that um, um, it doesn't have to be a term uh, for government, but government uses it a lot. But the idea is you have a lot of analytics that perform things. You need a model that basically says, uh, if I get um, a piece of carpet in, um, what is the fusion model that, or what is the fusion algorithm that works on that? Well, I've got something that measures the carpet, looks at the density, looks for tears, whatever, and I want to be able to execute that. And so the idea is you're just using the semantic model to recognize what it is that I have. Is it possible that it's a subclass of something else, that there's another analytic for it, or is it a superclass of something else that I need to check for certain properties to find out if that needs to be executed? 
And so you're just using that semantic model purely for the classing structure. And the last thing is uh, compliance applications. So the great thing here is that gold standards, things like legal uh, regulations or maybe internal um, uh, regulations that you have, policies, uh, they can be represented as a gold standard, which then can be encoded in, it doesn't matter if it's process or just data, it can be encoded into an ontology, uh, and then that pr provides a much more agile approach for those gold standard changes, because we all know that you know laws come out two years later, three years later, they change, corporate policy changes, et cetera. Um, industry models change, et cetera. So you will, uh, this just provides you an agility later. Later. By the way, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, ask them. I, I'm fine for yes, go ahead. Can you clarify what you mean by ontology? Yes. Uh, you know, I probably should have, tell you what, well, I'm going to jump two slides ahead, three slides ahead, um, and basically uh, just show you this real quick, and then we'll jump back to the other slides. But the idea of, there's a couple of different terms out there for what an ontology is. Uh, there's a, a famous one, it's a uh, formalization uh, of a conceptualization or something like that, I forget now, but I, I go with this one here. It's, it's just Steve Hamby's definition, I hope that no one else has it, and I'm, I'm uh, plagiarizing, but basically it's a formalized vocabulary. I think that's very important because there is a standard for, in the semantic web community for defining what a um, what an ontology is. It's not, you know, just so it, it, there is a very formal vocabulary, um, multiple people adopt it as a standard. Uh, of terms. So uh, you just define a series of terms. Um, you've got classing and subclassing and all those types of things. Explicitly define relationships. This this differentiates it from XML schema, let's say, because XML schema you could look at and say, uh, or even XML topic maps, we can go that far. Um, you could look at both of those and say, well, there's a taxonomy here, there's a definition of terms, there's a lot of things that create a vocabulary. But the thing is, you do not have explicitly defined relationships in either of those uh, vocabulary or formats, uh, standards. So this has explicitly defined relationships. And what I mean by that is you define a relationship between Steve and New York group uh, as being there, he was a speaker at. And so you can declare that relationship explicitly as opposed to saying um, Steve, person, document, and then having some um, you know hierarchical element in XML that might say, uh, speaker at or something like that. It's, there's just an implicit relationship there. You don't know exactly what it what it means. This you're actually defining the relationship between this uh, this person and this group as being speaker at. So it, so is it fair to say that that an ontology differs from some kind of a tree, an XML tree, yep. in that uh, there's meaning built into. That is correct. And that's what actually provides the ability to, for a machine to process it. When humans look at the web, we see the relationships by literally just point and click. If I mow a website and someone has a link there, I drill into that link and it takes me someplace else. And we just recognize in our brains that there's a relationship there. The idea behind the semantic web was we want to instantiate or explicitly define what that uh, relationship is. And we need some language that allows us to do that. So what you end up with is not a tree, it just is a set of terms, but you end up with a graph. Network. Yeah, a network. Yeah, a network. Basically, a, a very big network or graph. That's exactly what it is. So um, I appreciate you clarifying that. Maybe I should have thrown that slide up front. Um, I threw these slides, like I said, together uh, about five or six days ago. Um, so I don't ever like to, uh, I've been doing this for a long time. I don't ever like to come in here and tell you this is the silver bullet. It's curing cancer. It's curing uh, all the problems that we've got or anything like that. It's not. Um, and you do see people out here that are talking about the semantic web as being it's a cure-all. So what I'll do is I will tell you that there are some problems, there's some things that it solves, and there's some things it does really good, and there's some things that are out there that are are, are not things that it does. So uh, you'll see that folks out there are, will sell it as being an end-to-end, -end, that they've got something that does all of it. Uh, there's not one out there, so don't believe it. If you decide to go down this path, um, you know, just be very cautious that there's not, I, I know the, in the space really well, there's not a tool that does everything end to end. Um, so don't fall for that. There's uh, a lot of companies that are out there trying to learn. Um, this is a new technology. Uh, well, actually, it's been around since about, like I said, 2004 is when the specs actually uh, began to gel. Um, I don't really think there was a lot of work going on prior to around maybe 2001, 2000, other than maybe just some university type work. So it's relatively new. Um, there's also plenty of open source tools out there. I'm going to present three to you today that are probably my favorite three of the open source community that are Java-based anyway. Um, and so we'll go through those. And um, there's um, 
the other thing is, just because this is standards-based does not mean that it's going to be interoperable. What you'll find is that if you go down this path and you sell it to your management, that, hey, if we, if we go down this path, it's a standards-based model for representing data that can be used in our enterprise, but also be used for uh, exchange with our industry partners, customers, whatever. Uh, and then you decide that that means that you're automatically interoperable. What you'll find is that, just like with web services early on, uh, there were a lot of folks that were doing web services, all of them to standard, but there wasn't a good interoperability. So therefore, there were some set of standards called WSI that came out that created profiles and a bunch of other stuff. And you'll find that the same will happen in this community. There will be people out there that are still speaking to standards, still doing everything, but they're not interoperable with one another. So you just got to be careful with that. Don't, don't think that just because it's standards-based means it's interoperable. Uh, you see a lot of semantic web overselling. Um, the, even the, the uh, quote from um, the visionary, um, Tim Berners-Lee, talks about the concept of um, autonomous, interoperable agents acting over this uh, smart data and doing automated discovery and disambiguation. And you get people out there that are talking about this as if it's reality today, and it's not. There are certain things you can do. I do have apps that I've written that do automated discovery of services on the fly. You don't have to do the binding in advance. You ask a registry that it has the smart data in it, look up a model, tell me um, you know, the best app that I have for doing X, and it will look it up and give you back a, a, you know, a, a handle to, to invoke. So there are some automated discovery things that are going on. There are some disambiguation apps that I've written using a model to, like the hospital the scenario that I gave out. But that's not one I actually developed, but things like that. So there are some of these things, but there's not. This isn't a reality currently. <coughs> not currently. It's a vision. Okay. So don't get caught up on that. And I'm finding a lot more and more and more. I'm finding that um, when I go out and speak to sea level type folks, that I'm not having to talk about what is an ontology anymore. They already know. They already know what the semantic web technologies are and things of that nature. And um, I'm actually finding, uh, as is the case with this um, Fortune 29 company, that. Um, you know, CIO magazine or whatever, CIO is reading it, he calls up his guys and says, what do you know about this? And they well, we don't know anything about it. And he says, well, you need to find out about it. So you kind of get that type of thing going on. Um, but if anyone's familiar with the Gartner, um, uh, not Gartner, yeah, it is Gartner, uh, the, um, oh, what's it called, the um, um, technology um, adoption, adoption uh, technology, technology adoption curve. I don't know if we're at the slope of enlightenment, um, or which is the next thing before you get to the you know peak of, of uh, I'm sorry, the productivity level, or if we're at the peak of inflated expectations, which is you're getting ready to go through the trough of disillusionment. And I went through this with XML. I was in, I was an early adopter of XML back in the um, uh, my first app. I was around 99 uh, time frame. I was working for an XML server company in 2000. I went through this with XML, and uh, I see the same things going on now. So I don't know if we're at that peak here, or if we're already hit the bottom and we're on the ready to get productivity levels. So I really can't tell you, but I have seen uh, a tremendous drop off, followed by now there's a peak that's happening again. And I just, I'm hoping it's the latter, not the earlier. Um, but hey, we'll all find out together. And then uh, the other thing to look out for is that there's, this is a really hot space. It has been since the 2004 time frame. Um, I'll go back and just cover a couple of acquisitions. 2004, IBM acquired a company called um, um, Unicorn. Uh, Unicorn was a, uh, they basically, they had a really great app. They took an ontology model and they actually built out Java classes because what you'll find is that there's actually a lot of similarities between the two. So you define an uh, an ontology model that models your uh, real-world processes, real-world data, and then they would generate a series of um, Java classes that did manipulations on that, and actually uh, implemented inferencing and some other things on top of that model. Uh, very interesting application uh, that was in, ended up being part of uh, IBM's information server suite. It was one of the core pieces that, that was included there. Um, uh, Web Methods acquired a company called Cerebra uh, back in 2006. Uh, web methods then went on to integrate that into the fabric, and then that was actually moved over to Software AG in an acquisition there. I'm trying to think of it. Anyway, there's been a series of acquisitions uh, in this community. Every time a new product comes up and gets to a maturity level, a, a software company comes in and acquires it and incorporates it into their product line. Um, so that's one of the problems that you have here. So this interoperability, very important, and that's why I try to put a stop on that one. Because uh, just because it's a, 
excuse me, just because it's standards-based doesn't mean it's interoperable. It's pretty bad. I've got two slides of issues and concerns, and I'm trying to evangelize something. But hopefully that tells you that I'm a very cautious person, and I'm trying to tell you all the goods and bads about this. Um, so one of the things that you'll find is that uh, right now discussions still revolve around the billions of triples, as we call them. Triples are nothing more than in RDF terms, which I'm going to get into in a second. You've got a subject-object predicate, which represents a link, if you want to think of it on a web page. If you're sitting on a web page and you click a link, you've got this web page is um, maybe your um, uh, subject at that point. The object is going to be the page you're going to traverse to, and the triple would be whatever that link is that you just followed. That's a good example of what we're talking about. So you get folks talking about billions of triples, but not petabytes of data yet. So we're not at the enterprise level uh, in some cases. Um, not, not completely true, but for the industry as a whole, we're still talking billions of triples. Um, there, there's time to enhance these tools. Um, you know, it's still a young market. It's not bleeding edge like it was eight years ago, um, even six years ago, even five years ago. But it is still kind of leading edge. I would say. Uh, similar to XML and SOA, you, what you'll find is folks are trying to do ROI on a project that they go. Uh, so let's say uh, if I give you a bunch of code here today and you go back and you s s decide to sell this to your C-level, uh, someone gets you a sponsor and you start developing some application and then they say, well, hey, you look at this cost, you know, X hundreds of thousands of dollars or X millions of dollars, whatever it is, depending on what type, size pilot you decide to do. Um, what you have to realize is sell them in the same way that I did back in XML and SOA days is this is plumbing. The, the, first, the first one is going to be plumbing. Because it's standards-based and you're trying to focus on things like standards-based and interoperability, there's some plumbing that, that you have to acquire first. Once you've applied, acquired that plumbing, you can reuse that plumbing on multiple iterations, multiple uh, uh, projects. So it's just a, a sales uh, job that you have to do there. Another thing is there are some competing standards, although the W3C is what the industry is going after. You'll see a lot of um, um, academia still focus on some of the standards out of the ISO community, specifically the Knowledge Interchange Format, or KIF, if any of you are familiar with the things like Loom and uh, OKB, uh, OKDC and KBC, and some of the things like that that uh, were kind of early artificial intelligence stuff. This community, by the way, did evolve from the artificial intelligence community. Um, if you're familiar with some of the standards that are out there, academia still has some focus there, and you'll see a lot of research in that space. But these standards from the W3C, same guys that brought us XML, HTML, etc., are the ones that the semantic web are, uh, and most industries are uh, migrating to. Okay, there are various levels of smart data, depending as well, and we'll cover that uh, to some degree. And, uh, and then the other thing is, selling this is revolutionary, it's not. We talked about how it's just an evolution of that data-centric movement that's been going on in IT since 1971, February, when uh, Dr. Codd wrote that wonderful paper. Um, so, Steve, I have a question. So, the last company I worked for modeled everything in the company in, in a set of databases, a set of DDLs. And it, it was fantastic. I mean, basically, it was a mirror image of the, of the company. Mm -hmm. And we could ask questions about the company using the database. Okay. So what advantages does this give over that particular philosophy? Is it that the questions aren't, like in, in the old example, the one I just gave you, we have to know the queries ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that the queries are not needed ahead of time? Well, or? the queries are still needed in, in ahead of time, but the difference is um, because there's a uh, model, because there's a model here that basically has the subclassing and some things like that, which you don't have in, in, in relational database concepts per se. You, you would have to code those in yourself in triggers or procedures right. or something like that. Did, right. Yeah, exactly. So this model actually has that whole taxonomy. So it's got a whole taxonomy side to it. So I can put classing structures in there. Uh, basically what it allows me to do is I can query into a class. Let's say that I want to know about carpet. And then once I get into the carpet, I see I have multiple subclasses. And you could argue whether... Uh, Berber, carpet, you know, or shag, or whatever would be types, or whether they would be instances. But let's just say for now we're going to call them types. So these are subclasses, and they say, well, yeah, I'm looking for loop, so Berber's the route I want to go, or someone wants to put shag on their wall, so they're looking for shag. And so now they can move into different areas. Well, depending on the subclass you go to, you've got different properties that you're going to, you know, work with. And so now you're looking at those properties and say, yeah, I'm, length is important on shag, but maybe not so much important on, um, on um, 
Berber. I'm not a carpet expert. I should, probably should pick something I knew more about. <laughs> but uh, so let's just say that that, uh, that length is not important on on, uh, on uh, Berber. And so we say, well, um, uh, I'm, I'm interested in the length of the shag because I want three quarter inch shag, not not one inch shag or one and a half inch shag. And um, so I put that property. And these apps that are being developed are again are just thin apps that look at that model and then bring you back all the properties that are affiliated with that class and subclasses, and then when you manipulate down to a subclass, it gets the extra properties that, for the, that subclass, like length in this case. Um, and, uh, and then you'd say, hey, I'm looking for you know, half inch. So does it, again, could you have done it in, in um, relational databases? Sure, you could build that classing structure in your application. This just simply puts it into a model. And so now if I want to make changes, instead of having code changes, which is bad to tell a Java developer group, instead of making code changes, I go and change a data model. Um, so I'm changing data as opposed to code. Okay. That's uh, kind of one of the differences there. That's why it's data-centric. Um, but we still need Java to process the data. You do. And, and that's why when we talk about the apps, so these apps are all written in Java that I'm going to show you today. And most of them are written in things like uh, uh, Ruby or Java or something like that. I, I haven't, I've yet to find a COBOL um, <laughs> semantic web app yet. So we'll see. I might just write one just for the heck of it. <laughs> um, so, a lot of the anchor companies, um, I, I wanted to say this because a lot of the anchor companies are supporting RDF and OWL. Um, Oracle is one of them. Oracle entered the community about uh, three years ago, a little over three years ago. I want to say it was 2006, maybe 2005, so it may have been as much as five years ago. Uh, and it gave a major boost to the success of this movement. There were a couple others that... Um, uh, at the time, another Oracle company, BEA, um, had relationships with folks that were uh, pitching Semantic Web as an add-on to the Aqualogic uh, data services platform. Um, uh, it was a Florida-based company. Um, as I mentioned, IBM has a, in their information server has an, uh, a uh, Semantic Web application. And then um, there are a couple other companies that are I would consider industry anchors that are already using these technologies. Um, I was just having a, a um, discussion briefly. Uh, the Oracle Fusion actually has a small uh, subset of its uh, modeling is um, semantic-based. Um, a, a former uh, colleague of mine uh, heads up the, um, the uh, metadata uh, group there, and he's a big advocate of the semantic web community and wants Oracle to, to have more. I probably said more than I should since I'm in an Oracle facility, but, but uh, I, I would see that more and more movement for these anchor companies in supporting these technologies uh, soon. Um, I think you'll soon see this concept of something similar to a WSI, because we talked about it already. And what you find is that I um, can still be standards-based and not be interoperable with you, OK? Um, simple as that. And so there's going to have to be this concept of profiles and, and uh, interoperability testing and being able and all this kind of stuff that similar to the WSI created. Uh, another thing is. Uh, huge environment uh, is the intersection of cloud computing and semantic technologies. Um, because these semantic technologies, these models are very complex, and we were talking about billions of triples earlier as kind of being the limit right now, these graphs get humongous when you start trying to do internet scale uh, applications. That's part of the reason why uh, this community has not evolved like the vision originally uh, said it would. And it's because they're just the, the, the um, processing ability there were a lot of things in the um, cancer uh, research community uh, that they were using grid computing for quite some time, but cloud computing is uh, adding to that um, just because of the concepts behind it. And so what you're finding is a lot of cloud computing analytics are now semantic based. They're based on these standards that we're talking about, W3C and standards, et cetera. And so there's an intersection going on between these two uh, groups. There's also an intersection of the Web 2.0, things like wikis and that kind of stuff and the semantic web technologies. And so what you already see happening is SMW Plus is a derivative of Wikipedia, or MediaWiki, I should say, uh, the semantic media wiki. And you're able to define semantic wikis. So a good example, and this is what the semantic media wiki community uses as one of its, if I wanted to say, tell me all of the cities that have a female mayor uh, with a population more than a million, and you wanted to ask Wikipedia that, what you'd have to do is go through all the cities that had a female mayor, and then go through all the cities that had uh, million or more uh, residents or citizen population, and then do an intersection of the two. Uh, it, yeah, intersection of the two. And um, 
but the semantic media wiki allows you to do that in query format. Because these are actual uh, values that are in that model, uh, we can just do a simple lookup and say, I'm looking for female mayors and uh, one million population. Simple as that. Um, that's kind of the difference is it, you still get the same wiki contributions of folks you know, that want to say what it is they have to say, but you have this model that allows you to do a, a, a much richer query mechanism on the back side. And so, last but not least, I'll just talk about some common attributes. It's not really future perspective, but just these are things that if you're interested in getting into this space, I wasn't going to make a separate slide for this, let's put it that way. Um, basically, networking to share issues and how-tos. Things like this group here, uh, Marco uh, Newman here, runs the um, uh, New York City uh, Semantic Meetup, Semantic Web Meetup. And um, so, getting involved in a group like that. Get your C-level buy-in. As you already know, most, uh, as I was saying, a lot of CEO, CIOs already are tracking this. They already have on their radar screen. If you go to them and you say, hey, I'm, I want to pilot something like this, I want $30,000, and I'm going to do uh, open source tools only, I'm going to use these data sets, and I'm going to try to you know, fix this one problem here. Um, getting the C-level buy-in to do something like that is, I'm finding easier and easier. Uh, it used to be a very hard task. You had to go in and and um, evangelize, and you're not having to do it anymore. So go ahead and get the C-level buy-in and uh, you use that. And maybe it's a director level, depending on your organization. Uh, drive vendors with your requirements. This is a new community still. Think of it like uh, early XML days or something like that, even early SOA days. Um, you're still having to drive the requirements of the user, of the, of the vendor community to your, your uh, particular needs. And then keep multiple vendors ready to work your problem. There's a heavy M&A activity. Or you could go with like an Oracle Spatial that I don't foresee Oracle being purchased anytime soon. But if you're going with one of the smaller companies, just worry about this M&A activity. You want to focus on interoperability at that point very heavily. Okay. So get into some of the terms. And um, I'll, I'll try to speed it up. That went a little bit slower than I thought. But um, RDF uh, builds on the XML. Actually, it's kind of uh, sidelined XML. But there is an XML dialect that you can express RDF in. There's actually multiple uh, dialects that you could express it in, but we'll, we'll say it's built on XML. So built on XML to provide a simple data model to make statements about resources. Again, web page A, web page B, the link is, um, you know, whatever. Uh, it, this is, has more detailed information, whatever it might be. You can just make these statements about web pages, and so you're not actually marking up anything about that page. You just, you could, you could say extra facts about it, but you're simply making a relationship between page information or any other resource. Um, so it's a very uh, schemaless type of a uh, data model uh, using URIs and IRIs. The web ontology language, though, is a, uh, it's a layered ontology approach, and we'll talk about that here. Um, primarily, it's based on description logics, uh, the core part of it, the uh, Al ontology itself. But what you'll find is there's extra logic and proof that actually excuse me, goes into the uh, first order uh, logic level and, and uh, beyond um, uh, type layers. But it uses basic concepts of classes, data type, and object properties, and that's very important because it differentiates between the two. So you don't just have properties, but you've got data type properties like string and number, boolean, whatever, and you've got object properties, which are the relationship types of properties. And then you've got individuals. Um, so that's formalized vocabulary there. And you've got a set of uh, defined relationships uh, like equivalence, restriction, and subclass, several others. So I can say two classes are equivalent, two properties are equivalent, two individuals are equi equivalent. Uh, they're different. I can say these are explicitly different individuals, things like that. And then you've got a rules interchange format, which uh, covers mostly these areas here and this area here as well. Uh, basically, it's a standard format for interchange of rules across the languages. Um, they basically uh, went and got the uh, JSR community and picked up the specs there. They got the, uh, some of the academia community that were supporting the ISO standards um, and, um, and the uh, XML rules group. Brought them all together back in 2007, April, I think it was, or 2006, April, and said, hey, let's go up with a single rules interchange format that operates off of this concept of this rich classing structure. And so they came up with a spec, a spec last September. I think it was the last September, September. And that's the riff. Um, Sparkle, that's the query language and protocol, actually, for RDF. Okay? So this is just the stack here. Uh, I've put my own concepts on it so that you understand what each of these mean. This is nothing but encoding the RDF, the XML, and the URIs. 
You've got some structured things, the taxonomy, the model. You've got a combination of inference logic and this ontology structure mixed together in things like query and the ontology and the RIF. And then you've got extended logic that gets into first order logic, probabilistic, Bayesian theory, uh, things like that that cover things like trust and proof. And of course, you've got your security apps on the side to ensure that trust is really where it's at. Um, and then you get user apps. That's the stack of the semantic web. That's what it's um, you know built together. So it's a nice stack architecture for you. So there are some things that are different about this world. Um, traditional relational database theory, and this is one of the differences. I, I didn't want to cover it right when, when it was asked by Frank, uh, but this is one of the huge differences. Relational databases are, by default, closed world systems. A database will only tell you what it already knows. You have to tell a database some information in advance, and then when you ask it, it will tell you back. Open world environments um, are not that way. Um, you can actually um, um, uh, give a statement and, and then uh, have another statement, and it will possibly infer a statement if the two, if, they, if, it, if it can, based on you know, whatever logic and rules that, you, that you've given it. Uh, the other difference between these two is, um, is that um, if you make a, uh, actually this is the monotonic and non-monotonic, if you make a, in a monotonic world, if you add new statements, uh, it does not um, falsify your previous conclusions. So a good example would be Steve is a person and Steve is a speaker. Okay? In a non-monotonic uh, world, I could not make that. But in a monotonic, I can actually make that, um, that, um, those two statements. And as long as I've got some consistency ch checks that says a speaker is a subclass of a person or of something else, um, then it's okay. That's, it meets consistency. But in a relational database world, you'd have to, have to have two different objects that says Steve is a person and Steve is a speaker. You couldn't make it any other way. Okay? So these are some differences between the two. And then last but not least, there's this concept of prov uh, provability versus satisfiability or provable versus satisfiable. And the concepts here is basically in the semantic technologies world, you have the, the ability to say, I'm looking for something only if it's provable, provably true or whatever. What that means is that every um, case has to meet whatever it is I've asked, but I could also ask for something that's satisfiably true, and uh, then it's just if any case is true. So I might ask, is Steve Hamby in New York City? Uh, well, provably, no, because I was just in Jacksonville this morning, uh, Florida, and I was in... Um, Atlanta, drop over, and then I ended up here. Satisfiably, though, yes, I'm in New York City today because I am here right now. So that's kind of the difference between the two. Um, it's, a, it's really not that different when you get involved, but initially you might ask questions of your knowledge base and say, how many uh, people are in this you know, meeting? And you come back and say, uh, there's you know, two. And you're like, well, no, there's 30 here. Um, and it's just because of this open world closed world uh, type of assumption. But it also allows you to ask questions such as the um, uh, hospital. My data, I don't have any medical facilities listed in my data anywhere, but my model says that there's a subclass of this that is, um, is, is something that's in my data. And so now I can, I can look it up and get it. So we'll talk about some similarities between the semantic technologies and Java. Um, so a 1995 Sun article defined Java as I won't go through it all, but there's basically the concept behind it was it was buzzword compliant. Uh, if you go back and you look at the original definition of the uh, semantic web, it's also buzzword compliant. It talks about things like uh, agents and models and, I, I don't know, a bunch of really cool stuff. Um, so they're both buzzword compliant. So that's my first similarity between the two. Um, secondly, the idea behind classes in both Java and in the semantic community is they represent real world, real world phenomena. It's not just, you know, based on whatever. Uh, your, the idea behind an ontology is you're trying to model a particular domain in a formal manner as well as you possibly can. There's a hierarchical class structure where subclass, subclasses inherit the properties and methods of their superclasses. Uh, there's strong typing available, so uh, in both uh, tools. And I will say that in the uh, semantic web community, three of our most useful APIs that you see being used that are open source that are being used more and more by you know, the industry uh, are all Java APIs, and then specifically Jenna. Um, the Java, it's a Java API for building semantic <coughs> apps. Sesame, uh, which uh, it's a uh, 
gina.sourceforge. Um, it's on SourceForge under Gina. And um, OpenRDF, which is Sesame. And then the Manchester Owl API, a couple of different places where you'll find that one. Uh, but it's basically an API that was originally from the University of Manchester that's now um, actually been adopted by the W3C as standard for uh, manipulating ontologies. Okay? Um, I'm going to go through now each one of these open APIs a little bit, show you some source code for it. And then, like I said, if you're interested in the actual source code later, um, I guess you can either take my business card and ask, ask me for uh, more information on it, or you can just get the email that Frank will send out. Um, so Jenna is, was open source. It was developed in the HP labs. It um, includes an RDF API for reading and writing RDF in multiple formats. And notice that XML is one of those formats. That's why I said it's not necessarily built on XML, but there is an XML serialization of it. And then it also has an OWL API uh, storage mechanism for both memory. Uh, you can actually pull data directly out of an RD, uh, RDB relational database system represented as RDF, or you can store it in memory or actually store it into like files and um, other um, existing RDF stores. And they do offer some support for uh, querying. Uh, multiple versions of it. Um, most of the community is using the second version, of course, and it makes sense. But you do still see some folks using just the uh, first one. This is an example of an RDF graph. Uh, basically, you just have some information here that says, some URI, in this case John Smith, um, has this particular relationship, and the object or the value of it is John Smith, and it's got a given name of John and a family name of Smith. Okay, uh, this was its full name, um, and so this is kind of how you develop this graph concept in RDF. Um, and so here's basically some Jenna code that would say somewhere John Smith, this guy here. Uh, create the John the Smith and then add the two together to get this and then you basically define a model um, create that model um, take the person URI which is this one here John Smith and define that as a resource and um, I'm gonna not touch the screen anymore because I got it moving uh, define the resource uh, add the full name in each of one of the different items and then you're basically just connecting these uh, uh, items so on a web page, I could look at a web page, find certain data out of it, and then use this API to go and say, well, my web page is this, and a piece of information that I want off that web page is here and here and here, and I can use these add property um, methods in order to add the properties for that particular web page. Okay? So that's how you would use this Gen API to go through and build out an RDF model of existing data structures. And if you want to serialize that model in XML, then you just simply say model.write and uh, whatever was in your uh, figure out. Uh, if you want to load a model in memory, you can grab it from a file. Um, there should be an actual another slash there. My apologies. Again, I put these together really quick. Uh, you just simply model read, and you read in your AL file or RDF at that point, and it will create the model for you. Um, so that you can then manipulate it, and add new properties to it, whatever you want to do. And then you can actually get information of a URI um, by simply putting and saying, uh, get the resource, whatever this is, and uh, open that resource up so that you can add extra properties to it. Okay. You can also get properties of a particular resource. So if you've got all that data built up and you want to be able to query it, that's one way of doing it. You can search for information in a model by simply defining an iterator, iterating over your various properties, and then just checking the value of those, printing them out, whatever you want to do. And if you want to, there's actually some more advanced querying in this uh, RDQL tool. Um, and then they do also support union intersection and difference. And I'll give you an example of a uni union here, where you take two models and you union, union them together to get the results of all the items. So if you had um, a document about Steve Hamby being a document about the Java, community group, you do the union together and you get everything. Okay. And uh, as I mentioned, there, Jitta was great. It was probably the first tool out there that said, hey, let me define some uh, JDBC driver. I should have used Oracle. Uh, but let me define some JDBC <laughs> driver. And, um, well, you did. Yeah. You did. I did? My SQL. Oh, there you go. Oh, well, that's true. It is. Yeah, what am I thinking? Um, so yeah, so it's more for Oracle. <laughs> so, um, you're right. Uh, so yeah, you, you define some JDBC driver, and then you, um, uh, and then basically you uh, 
are able to say, here's my RDF model, and then you bring that in as triples and you're able to store it, um, um, store it in a relational database or go from a relational database back to the triple format. Uh, so it's a great tool that allows you to take a model, put it into the relational database so that it can be created as uh, SQL at that point. Uh, the Ontology API allows you to support uh, the RDF schema and then a couple of other standards. The DAML, DAML oil were things that were still kind of uh, academia. DAML, DAML actually is the DARPA agent markup language, which is a United States uh, DOD agency. Uh, the DAML oil, uh, the oil came from Europe, the European Union, both the Ontology inference layer, and um, the two together is what evolved to be OWL. Um, sorry for the having that long description. but. This tool supports all three of those different uh, formats, four formats, I should say. It's language independent, uh, so it's not just bound only to um, English or French or whatever. Uh, it's multiple language support. And there is some inference support. Um, you can actually uh, bring in different inference engines. Define an inference engine real quick. It's a piece of uh, that generic um, code that I mentioned, um, sometimes in Java, sometimes in other formats, that operates over that model. And using the formalized vocabulary of the model can make decisions about your domain without having any specific uh, um, information about that domain embedded in the inference engine, okay? Just by looking at the model and the formalized uh, vocabulary for it. Uh, the ONT model is the tool that there is the uh, class that you use to uh, load up the entire ontology model. Uh, ONT class, of course, represents classes. Um, and then basically your relationships amongst those classes. Okay. You do have some different forms of classes, enumerated class, some of these down here at the bottom. We won't go into those in detail. But basically, if you want to import your uh, example.al, I just simply say, here's my uh, file name. Uh, I got a base URI for that. And then I want to um, create an ontology model um, off of that uh, file name here, model read, and then I give it the file name. So, um, okay. What I'll do is go over an example. There was a fellow that early on um, that worked for MITRE named Roger Costello created this uh, concept of a camera ontology um, back in about 2001. For those of us that were new, that's kind of what we all learned it on because it was very easy to understand. You had a camera, you had different types of cameras, you had lenses with the camera, shutter speeds, you had all kind of great uh, properties to think about. And so a lot of my examples that I have out there are still based on this. But anyway, um, basically you have a camera namespace add the term camera to that, and that's what, you know, gets your first ontology class. You just iterate through the um, ontology, because it is an XML document, so it basically uses some of the same iterators that you would have, but you just iterate through it, you get your local name that you want, and um, um, and then basically you have that uh, particular class, that's how you find a class, or you can actually construct a class the same way. Um, you can create a class, simple here. Another class there, you can actually put the property between the two, say that uh, there's a part and a body. And then uh, what you'll see is an ontology that ends up looking, actually I didn't define the ontology for that one, but here's an, another example where we're creating the class for window. Window. Uh, well, actually through the lens, I'm sorry, there it is. So there's a resource there that has a value for that. There is a uh, viewfinder um, resource there. Um, so anyway, this is the way that you create the class. And what you notice is that you start in the center and work your way out. So you notice that you're defining these first, and then you define your restriction, and then you define your intersection, and then finally your SLR at the bottom. So you've got to work your way out on the model um, as you work down. And um, let's see, you can define the schema and define individuals. I've got code there and then the actual ontology again. I'm not going to go through these for sake of time in detail. And then you've got a, a query engine. Um, basically, you can define a query, iterate through the result. Uh, here's an example of a Sparkle query. It doesn't look a lot like um, SQL, but kind of. It does, just looks nothing like um, XQuery, though. But uh, basically, you define prefixes. These are your namespaces. And then you just simply say, I'm selecting uh, you know, properties, objects, subjects, whatever it is I'm looking for, where. And then you can define some filters on that. There's a lot of other things that you have. Uh, you can define the, the filter at the um, data level, or you can define it on the result set. There's all different types of things that you have in the Sparkle. But basically, 
you've got a result set in the Geno Sparkle engine that allows you to iterate over that result set and do matching to it and other things of that nature. Um, but you put the Sparkle query directly in it as well. Okay. This is the basic um, architecture of how you in incorporate other reasoners into this uh, uh, Geno inference layer. There's a list of some of the basic reasoners that you um, can support. You'd have to know a lot more about them, but the idea behind the reasoners is I've got just some Java code here that defines the reasoner, and then I've got an ontology over here that defines my model. Without knowing anything about that particular domain uh, or anything else in there, you can look at this um, um, restriction here and says there's only one of these in the max cardinality for a camera, and because I've defined more than one, I've defined two down here, Kodak and Olympus, it'll come back and say there's too many values on, the, on that particular property. So it doesn't tell you which property it is or anything like that. I mean, you could actually get it to say that, but um, it doesn't know it in, the, in there. It didn't have a check in the code or anything. It just used the model to figure that out. That's the idea behind the reasoning side of the, of the inference engines. The other part of it is, is it'll infer new information for you uh, based on open world assumption. Okay. Uh, Sesame is another tool that uh, came out of the OpenRDF group, and uh, it's a Java API for um, RDF applications. It's got Sparkle support. It has this uh, concept of a storage and inference abstraction layer, uh, which is kind of like a JDBC for the semantic web community. Um, and it actually is supported in other uh, la uh, languages as well, but Java is the one I always use on it. Um, here's its architecture. Uh, basically, you've got this um, repository API. You've got the uh, Sesame server, and you've got a cell API that can sit on top of things like JDBC databases for relational memory, or you can actually store it locally in files or in a native server, either one. Um, you've got a couple of different um, mechanisms in here uh, as well as work off of. Um, it works over uh, HTTP. There's basically four um, core jar files, a Sesame .core, uh read input and output. Um, um, Later for reading and writing, an open RDF model for the core RDF model. You don't really change that one at all. Um, and then uh, shared utility classes. Uh, some examples of um, some of the interfaces that you can uh, use and um, repurpose. Okay. And that sets me cell. Yep, I'm, I'm going to hit time, I think. And um, the cell can be used, I'll just cover this quickly. The cell can be used to abstract, abstract the data stores inferencing layers and some other things. Um, so it's, uh, it's a nice abstraction layer. And then last uh, API is the AL API. The idea behind this, um, I wrote my first one uh, AL API in probably 2005 or 2004. I don't remember now what year it was. But I wrote it on top of an XML server. And I was using an XML server basically for all the data we were feeding into it. And I just simply put an AL API on there. Uh, so that I could uh, work with the XML content as as, uh, as Al ontology. So I could feed in Al ontologies. And I wrote this on top of an XML server back in that time frame. Very easy tool to use. Uh, the the uh, methods in it are very straightforward. Came out of the University of Manchester, a fellow by the name of um, uh, Dr. Ian Horks um, and his team originally wrote it. But it's got support for a lot of different uh, items in the semantic web community um, and also integration into um, uh, different reasoners that are on the market currently. And um, a couple things you can do with it is parse your documents. You can do the modeling, actually build out the XML, uh, I'm sorry, the ontologies inside of your, uh, inside of the API. You can do manipulation of the graphs themselves, uh, inferencing, or individuals, if you want to call it. And then you can do uh, serialization into different formats. So these are all things you can do with, um, with the uh, API. Here's how you load an ontology. You've got this actual code uh, all the way through. Uh, basically, you just give it a URI uh, where your ontology is, and you simply say load ontology from physical URI. Give it that physical URI, it'll load it up, and then you can actually start working off of it. Okay. Um, you can add axioms, like add new classes. Uh, how this is useful, all of these, uh, maybe I should uh, just kind of let you look through the code since I've only got a couple minutes left, but um, add individuals, uh, reasoners, um, etc. But how all of those were useful is. If you wanted to build a web app and allow your users to build these models on the fly without having to go through and get one of these tools that you know, gave them a user interface, you could pick one of these APIs and say, let a user put in names of you know, terms 
that they're interested in using and say what they're aligned to, what are the properties of them, and things like that, and use these classes, or I'm sorry, these APIs as ways to build those behind the scenes, okay? And then do the reasoning on it and all that. So to summarize everything, the semantic technologies, semantic uh, web technologies, they represent a huge impact to the IT. It's just the, the evolution of the data-centric movement. There's a lot of similarities in Java and some semantic web technologies. Uh, I've covered some of them. And the three most uh, used APIs are all Java-based. Um, so it's very easy for you as a Java developer to get started and, uh, you know, build a pilot. Again, there will be source code um, available to help you out if you want it. Great. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, and while Michael is setting up, if you have any questions for Steve. Actually, uh, I had a question. Okay. Um, so it seems like we have semantic web on one side, then we have the next generation database on the other side. And let me preface it by, when you build a web app, what's the number one problem with the web app? One, number one bottleneck is usually the database. So there's all these new next generation databases that are distributed or they're column based. And it seems like this is very, it's almost like monolithic in a sense. Well, actually, the, the interesting thing is that um, I mentioned that, um, so some of the column uh, based uh, things that are out there, um, a lot of the work that I have going on is actually using semantic web technologies with things like uh, Hadoop or whatever. That's a column-based um, uh, store um, and in, in a cloud environment. And so we're taking the ontology models and actually storing that, those graphs directly into columnar stores. That's one of the movements for it. So it, it's not a either or. There's, like I said, there's an intersection between some of these movements that are going on and how you can store um, the um, semantic web uh, resources. Uh, the graph can be represented in column databases, be represented in relational, be represented in an actual RDF graph database. Right. So it doesn't have to be in one source. It can be That's across. right. Okay. It could be across multiple things. Yeah. Good.